breaking of the endothelial tissue, the lining of the blood vessels, and they just start clumping together, which causes the clot. Purpose for our arterial clot is it's initiated by the platelets. The platelets start fibrin formation. That fibrin then forms a platelet's receptor protein, which then converts it from fibrinogen into fibrin, and that causes the clumping. It'll trap your red blood cells in that fibrin. It makes like a mesh net in there, and the clot just keeps growing and growing and growing. Your vessels can be occluded from that. It can even result in ischemia of that vessel. A venous thrombus usually results from slowing down of the blood flow. The venous thrombus form more quickly. Frequently, they break free and travel. More often than not, you'll hear them say that they've got a thrombus that travel to the lung. But they can go to other areas. On your anticoagulants, anticoagulants do not dissolve the blood clots, but rather they prevent new ones from forming. Some of the treatments, the reason we use those is if you've got a deep vein thrombosis, or you'll hear it called a DDT. It can be a pulmonary emboli, and that's when the vessel has broken loose and gone into the lung. Patients, and that can happen rather quickly. If you have a patient that suddenly, for no apparent reason, becomes difficulty breathing, they get real short of breath, typically their lips will turn blue. Your first thought ought to be that they've gotten a clot that has gone loose and gone to the lung called a pulmonary emboli. If it gets into the coronary vessels, a coronary thrombus can result in a mild corneal infarction. They call that an MI. Sometimes it happens after an artificial heart valve replacement or after a stroke. A stroke can result from a clot coming loose or a clot forming in the vessels in your brain. Some types of anticoagulants that you'll see used is heparin. Heparin is the main one that we use a lot for patients that are now in the hospital that's not up moving like they typically do. We don't want a clot to form in those legs, so they may get heparin sub-Q. You can do heparin IV push, and you can do it as an infusion. We also have what's called low molecular weight heparins, and then we have direct thrombus inhibitors and oral coagulants. The oral coagulant we're going to start with is warfarin, or you'll frequently hear it called Coumadin. It will vary depending on your patient. You go by body size, body weight, the diagnosis, but typically your docs will order 5 to 10 milligrams daily as initial loading dose, and then they put them on a maintenance dose. They will check lab values the lab value that they're going to watch um, is international, international normalization ratio, INR levels. Depending on what that is, is going to be how much they maintain. Can be five to five, five to two to five milligrams a day. Uh, a lot of your cardiac doctors will want it around two and a half, three and a half to maintain those vessels. Some contraindications you want to kind of consider, even though the docs order it, your patient has a blood dyscrasia. If it's a preeclampsia patient, if they are a known alcoholic, if they've had bleeding tendencies, if they've had a head injury of some kind, you might want to say, hey doc, because sometimes they get busy and get patients mixed up, may not realize that. And the Coumadin warfarin is only going to make it bleed more. The use of the warfarin is to prevent a blood clot from forming. It's not going to correct one that's already there, but we just don't want new ones to form. Some side effects to the warfarin is anorexia, some nausea, vomiting. They can have abdominal cramping. Patients can break out in a rash. 
they can have halopecia where they lose their hair or what's called stomatitis. Some patients have complained about irritation in their mouth. Some adverse reactions with that is what's called a purple toe syndrome. If you have a patient that's on warfarin and you notice their toes turn a purplish blue and they're cold, that could be a reaction with the warfarin that they're on. Some nursing indications, like I said, you want to watch and monitor that international normalization ratio. You'll hear it called a PTINR. Um, patients, I've had patients as high as a few weeks ago, I had a patient that was 13. Believe you me, that patient was not allowed to get out of bed for no reason. Uh, not till I got it down to a reasonable level. We will monitor those INR levels on a daily basis when they're in the hospital. When they go home, it's going to kind of vary, but typically they'll monitor them initially for a, a week at a time and then it will go to a month at a time. Some medicines, if the patient's on medicines that you need to kind of watch because it's going to interfere with the absorption of the warfarin, is your NSAIDs, your anti inflammatory meds, such as your aspirin. You also have a reaction that it's not going to absorb with phenotonin, which is your dilantin, your seizure medicine. Semitidine, which is tagamint. Tagamint is another gastric medicine. Something recently that we have started in the last two or three months is sucrophate or caraphate. Um, for many, many years, caraphate's given before meals. Well, so is warfarin. Warfarin is typically given around 5 o'clock in the afternoon. That way it doesn't interfere with meds, with foods that they're taking. Well, we've always gave this caraphate at 5 o'clock. Well, that's when the Coumadin is. So watch your meds when you're passing meds. That if you've got a patient on some of these drugs, to give them at least an hour apart because it will interfere with the absorption. One is an allopurinol. That's a gout arthritis medicine that will interfere with the absorption. Your oral hypoglycemic. Um, all of these will cause the Coumadin to make an increased risk for a bleeding more. It, it doesn't absorb right. You want to monitor their skin monitor that for petechia. Petechia is the little purple dots that they'll get on their skin. Watch the gums of their mouth. Um, recently, about a month ago, a friend of mine has been started on Coumadin. She's been on it for six months now. She was eating potato chips and cut the underneath edge of her tongue. That caused her to bleed out. She wound up having to go to the emergency room and have it cauterized. Little things that you don't think about, um, especially in the mouth. Brushing their teeth. They can have their gums bleeding just from brushing your teeth. Watch for blood in the stools. The stools can be dark. You can actually see the blood. They will have abnormal bruising. Bruises will be bigger. Some of the dietary teachings. Watch what they're eating. A lot of times if they eat copious amounts of your green leafy vegetables such as your broccoli, your spinach, that will interfere with the accumulant levels. Your green vegetables especially are significantly high in vitamin K. Vitamin K blocks the action of your warfarin. Therefore, your blood won't thin out as much. Also, some that you may not think about is over-the-counter meds such as garlic your ginkgo, your ginger, those are items that can inhibit the absorption of the Coumadin for it. You want to make sure the patient knows and understands before any procedure that includes dental cleaning of the teeth, any procedures, any surgeries, to let those physicians know that they've got to stop those medications. They need to wear a medical ID alert. If they were to get in an accident and they're not <coughs> conscious enough that they could tell the EMS that they are on medicines, 
they're going to build you significantly more. Some important teaching things to know is you've got to make sure they know and understand they have to do follow-up on those labs. We've got to keep levels. That's where I have found the biggest problem with my patients is, oh, I forgot to go and get my levels checked. Oh, I forgot. Well, you can't forget. We've got to know what those levels are. Some side effects that you'll need to teach your patient is to watch for that abnormal bleeding. They need to use a soft toothbrush. Soft toothbrushes won't scrape at the gums as bad as the hard bristles. They also need to start using an electric razor or shaver, and that's for women also. Because with a regular razor, you nick yourself, you're going to be bleeding for quite a while. Monitor your patients when they fall, especially their heads. Uh, they get to having funny looking eyes. They get to talking funny. Um, we need to watch to make sure that, that they're not going to bleed going on in that brain. When the Coumadin levels get high enough, especially the higher it goes over 5.5, you'll see the docs order vitamin K. They're giving that to reverse some of that blood thinning medicine, especially with your patients that have got these obvious signs of acute bleeding. When they get high, like my patient that had the level of 13, we were giving him infusions of fresh frozen plasma. That'll also help re reverse the effects. Some of your other inhibitors that we've started using is, I have no idea how to say this, Riva, Zofabin, which is your Zeralto, your Eloquist. These are a couple of new ones. There's a new one that's come out we were told about this week. I don't have the name yet because I haven't seen a patient come with it. But with these, they don't have to have the lab values. Their, their labs are not monitored. There's nothing to monitor. So it's a good thing, but yet a bad thing. Who knows what their blood level is? How thin is it if you don't have a test to show it? Your antiplatelets, the purpose for that is to prevent an MI, prevent a stroke, especially in your patients that have a strong family history of that. It can prevent the repeat of a stroke. If they have a TIA or a MI, given them antiplatelets will decrease the risk of having a major one. One type is aspirin. Aspirin is a low-dose suppressant of antiplatelet aggregation. Usually the dose is 81 milligrams to 325 milligrams. You need to teach your patients again that they have to have this medicine stopped seven days before they have any kind of oral procedures, surgeries, because it puts them at an increased risk of bleeding. Some of the adenosine diphosphate antagonists that um, we can talk about, there's three different kinds. We have Persantine, Ticlid, and Plavix. Plavix is the one that I see used more often than not. Your Plavix, loading dose is typically 300 milligrams. You'll give them a loading dose to get that blood started, kick started then we'll drop them down to typically 75 milligrams a day. Some of the actions, it, it inhibits the platelet aggregation, prevents the ADP from binding with the ADP platelet receptor. Usually we give Plavix and aspirin together. Um, that just gives them a double dose to where they can get this blood thinned out. Some of your contraindications, again, for your, your plavix is your intracranial hemorrhages. You don't want a patient that's got an intracranial bleed or the potential for a bleed to be on these antiplatelet plavix because it's going to thin that blood and make it bleed more. Another is if your patient currently has a peptic ulcer or has a history of a peptic ulcer, that can trigger it and start the bleeding again. So you may have to add a, what's called a PPI, that's some of the protonics, the Prolisex, those kind of medicines to prevent that ulcer from forming or to make it worse. 
your indications for use is you want to prevent a reoccurrence of that MI, prevent a reoccurrence of a stroke or even vascular death. It can cause damage to the vessels and cause those vessels to die. It can also help to prevent a reocclusion. If they go in there and put stents in, we don't have them on something that clots can start forming and clot off those stents. It also helps when you're what they call ballooning, a PTCA, percutaneous translunar coronary angioplasty. When they balloon them out and get those clots out of there, get those plaque out of there, um, you don't want another clot to form. Some of the side effects with that, you'll hear patients complain of a lot of abdominal pain. They're dizzy. And because of all of that, they get flu-like symptoms where they're achy. They just don't feel good. Nosebleeds, headaches. All of that will lead to the patient being run down and fatigued. Some adverse reactions with that is it drops their blood pressure. Uh, I've had patients that I've had to give their blood pressure medicines and wait an hour and give them the plavix to keep them from interacting together. It can also cause bronchial spasms to where they'll be coughing a lot. Can cause the thrombocytopenia. And then agranulocytosis. Some of your nursing actions, watch again for the bleeding of the gums, GI bleed, the petechiae on the skin. They're gonna watch their complete blood count because uh, they want to watch what that platelet count is, what those red blood cell count is. This is another one that you need to teach those patients. Stop this medicine seven days before procedures. Um, we don't want to get in there even to have oral cleaning and those gums start bleeding. And this is also the herbal medicines, the garlics, the ginkgo. Uh, this increases the, the risk of the bleeding. Your plantal, plantal inhibits the platelet aggregation. It's also a vasodilator and it's used for patients that have intermittent claudication. Your thrombolytics, thrombolytics are used to dissolve blood clots by the breaking down that fibrin. Um, the less fibrin we have there, the less clots that are going to be forming. This can be administered either at IV after a MI, but you've only got a certain window. Um, we've got four or six hour window to, to get this on board. Or with a thrombolytic stroke, you've only got three to four hours to get this medicine on board. Some of the medicines is urokinase, alteplase, TPA, and streptokinase. If you've got patients with central lines, the PIC lines or the central lines, we can get the alteplase in there to loosen up those clots because the longer those patients have those central lines, the more tendency they have of them clotting off. And especially if those lines are being used for daily blood draws. It's going gonna, it's gonna to clot them off quicker. So you can get, I know at our hospital, we use alteplase in our central lines. <coughs> your vitamins, in your textbook, you should have checked on a table 15-2. That'll talk a lot about your vitamins that we're going to talk about. It's a recommended daily allowance. RDA is the amount thought to provide the needs for 98% of your children and adult, adults. There's a table also on 15.1. Those have got your information on your, your vitamins. Some of the justification for vitamin supplements is malabsorption. If your patient's got a gut issue to where they're not absorbing the food and nutrients, meds, we can put them on vitamins. Also, if they're having chronic diarrhea, the chronic diarrhea, they're going to be wasting those vitamins. They're not going to be hanging on to them. If they've got infectious or inflammatory disease processes, um, like your Crohn's disease or celiac disease, they're not able to absorb the vitamins that they need to maintain
There can be an increased vitamin loss when you've got infection, um, it's eaten away at that, you've got hyperthyroidism, your hemodialysis patient because they're washing that blood out, they're not absorbing their vitamins. If you've got cancer patients with the chemo, it's not hanging on to the vitamins that they need to maintain themselves. If they're on these crash diets or their patient is starving themselves, they're going to lack the vitamins. Some increased reasons for vitamin requirements is your children. Of course, we all know, many of us do, kids ain't going to eat very much good stuff. They're going to want to eat that junk. Well, that junk stuff doesn't have your vitamins that you need. Also, when you're pregnant, when you're pregnant, you're going to need more vitamins because now you've got you and that baby you to take care of. Some debilitating diseases, GI surgery, alcohol patients. Alcohol patients are not going to have the vitamins that they need. Your vitamins can be divided into two categories, fat soluble and water soluble. So we're going to start with the, the fat soluble. Fat soluble vitamins are metabolized much slower and are stored in fatty tissue, in liver, and in the muscles. First one we're going to talk about is vitamin A, retinol. It can be toxic if taken in very large amounts. This, and because you've got all that vitamins in there and they're toxic, you will turn jaundice. Some reasons that we have vitamin A, we put a patient on it, is it's required for your eyes, gums, and teeth, and your normal hair growth. If you don't have enough vitamin A, you can see deficiencies in those areas. Foods that are high in your vitamin A is your fortified milks, your butters, your eggs, the leafy green and yellow vegetables and fruit. Some of your meats is your cod, halibut, sharks, and tuna. This will give us the extra boost that we need with those. The deficiencies that you'll see is they'll have excessively dry skin, they'll have poor tooth development, can even result in some night blindness. Vitamin D, which is your calciferol, we also call that the sun vitamin. Some toxic symptoms is if it's hyper, you got too much of it on board. That can lead to anorexia, nausea, and vomiting. Some causes for that is the in, with the increase in deficiency is due to you stay indoors too much or you use too much sunblock. I know they, they preach and preach and preach about using sunblock when you're out in the sun, but we've got to have some of the sun to make us healthy. The functions for your vitamin D is to promote the use of your phosphorus and calcium. Phosphorus and calcium helps to build our bones. We've all heard that as a bone of bones. You've got to drink this calcium, eat this meal, so that we can have strong bones. Your food sources is your fortified meals. Eggs, especially the yolk of the eggs, tuna, salmon, and liver. Deficiencies that you'll see in kids when they don't have enough vitamin D is they'll have rickets. In the older adults, you'll see osteomalacia, it's a wasting away of the bones. Typically, they'll give the vitamin D with a calcium. Sometimes you'll even find it's calcium plus vitamin D is in one tablet. Your vitamin E, vitamin E protects the fatty acids and it may have a link to protecting your heart. It prevents macular degeneration and helps with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Um, that's a free radical theory that we don't know a whole lot about the Alzheimer's. It's more or less of ruling out what's not that we have left. but. Um, a lack of the vitamin E can cause some of that. It promotes the formation and functioning of red blood cells and the muscle tissues. It'll help promote the use of that. Your food sources is your whole grain cereals, wheat germ, vegetable oils, sunflower seeds, milk, eggs, meat, avocado, and asparagus. 
deficiency can can result if you're not getting enough of your vitamin E can result in a breakdown of your red blood cells. Side effects. Mm -hmm. Taking too much of the vitamin E can prolong what's called your prothrombin time. Prothrombin time goes with your INR um, to monitor um, how thin your blood is. So it can interfere. So that would be another one that you would need to look at to not give it when you're giving your warfarin. Typically vitamins are given in the morning with breakfast time and the warfarins is given at dinner time in the evenings. And you need to watch to not take care, take vitamin E at the same time if you're on an iron supplement. Um, iron has a tendency to interfere with the absorption of your vitamin E. Your vitamin K. Vitamin K is used as an antidote when the platelet count is too high. Um, so it is essential for the clotting of the, the blood. We don't want it too thick to where we're clot causing blood clots, but we don't want it either to be too much. 50% of your natural vitamin K is in your intestinal floor. 50% of it comes. Your leaf, green, leafy green vegetables, liver, cheese, egg yolk, vegetable oils, and tomato is high in the vitamin K. Your newborns, when babies are first born, uh, they are automatically deficient in it. They've not had the opportunity to build it up. So typically babies are given a, an IM to get that first dose on board to kind of kick start that vitamin. Vitamin K can result in increased clotting time, which can lead to bleeding or hemorrhaging. So if, if we're not getting enough on there, some side effects as a result of the vitamin K is you'll find an elevated um, bilirubin. Your water soluble vitamins is mostly your B vitamins, B complex vitamins. One of the main ones is B1 or thiamine. It is used to promote the use of sugar and the nervous system in the heart. Your food sources is your enriched breads and cereals, liver, pork, fish, milk, lentils, and believe it or not, blackstrap molasses is high in that. Deficiencies that you need to be aware of is some of their sensory um, disturbances. Um, their eyes move involuntarily. Uh, they can have increased blurred vision. Can retard their growth result in fatigue, nausea, and associated with your alcohol patients. Um, frequently, we're giving thiamine in some form when we have an alcohol patient. Um, it can be given as IM, or we can hang it as a piggyback. Um, you will hear patients, uh, nurses say, where's my banana bag? That's what this is, it's a multivitamin bag of fluids that's high in thiamine to replace what those alcoholics are losing. Another one is B2, which is your riboflavin. It is used to promote the use of carbs, proteins, and fats by releasing energy to the cells. It is required for tissue integrity and it can be used to treat migraines. Your food sources are enriched Breads, cereals, milk, liver, lean meat, eggs, almonds, wheat germ, soy, and your again, your leafy green vegetables. So a lot of your vitamins, as you can see, has those leafy green vegetables. So when you have those patients on the, the warfarin or the Plavix, they don't necessarily need to stop eating them all together. They just need to use it in moderation. <coughs> Deficiencies that can result when you're low in your B2 is visual disturbances. They can have a rash. That patients may complain of numbness in their extremities. The corners of their mouth will be cracked. And it can cause inflammation in the skin and the tongue. It can cause sores like canker sores on the tongues. 
B3, which is your niacin. It is assist with the nervous system. It's useful in treating hyperlipidemia by flushing those sensations out. Your food sources is enriched breads and cereals, eggs, meat, liver, beans, and peas. Deficiencies that can result when you're low <coughs> is, again, it can retard the growth. Palagrera, which is, that affects the skin, nervous system, can re, and it results in dermatitis, diarrhea, and some mental retardation. You can have headaches, memory loss, insomnia, anorexia. As you can see, about all the deficiencies are kind of running together, so you've got to be careful to differentiate which vitamin is where. Malabsorption syndrome. 